topic like this, but um, yeah, we'll do what we can. I work with councils making local plans. Uh, that's my area of expertise, not necessarily specifically biodiversity net gains, but like everyone, you know, I'm having to learn about that uh, to be effective in, in the plan making world. Uh, so I thought what I'd do is I'd try and reflect uh, or go on the journey that councils I'm working with uh, are currently or work, I'm currently working with are taking when it comes to uh, BNG and plan making. So I'm going to go through what are the BNG or the biodiversity requirements today? How are the key components of mandatory uh, BNG changing things? Um, how do we begin factoring all of this into our plan making activity? Uh, and then I'll go into a few specifics about what the plan should say and do. And then I'll outline the pad support and then we'll we'll take some questions and I'll answer them where I can. I'll have some opinions. Uh, I've also got my colleague, I think, Becky Mobley on the call somewhere. But anything we can't, uh, deal with today we've got a team of uh, biodiversity experts back at PAS um, that can help so let's just move on my side so yeah I'm Martin Hutchins just quickly local plans principal advisor uh, I've been with PAS for ooh, 15 odd years now um, we sit within the LGA we're funded by the Department for Living Up Homes and Communities and our whole budget is based on helping councils improve what they do understand requirements of planning from government etc so that's that's a bit about PAS for those of you that didn't know us so there's lots already in place uh, nationally, national policy and guidance. And you know, while there are those uh, organisations out there that want to do the right thing, want to do good things, I think it's fair to say there isn't much compelling them to do it. Uh, there's not much out there with any teeth and not much that can't be sort of quickly argued away with a, a viability uh, argument. And obviously there's nothing until uh, November that's, that's going to be mandatory. So most of what we see today is couched in terms of you know where appropriate or uh, or or where possible or that kind of sort of language so uh obviously there is uh, lots of guidance the mppf paragraphs 170 174 uh, 175 that's where you want to go to have, that has the most to say about biodiversity at the moment uh, there are other national planning uh, guidance uh, available there's um National Environment Planning Policy Guidance, Infrastructure Commission's uh, Design Principles, uh, National Design Guides, and of course, I think importantly, the government's 25-year Environment Plan, where I think the idea for biodiversity or mandatory BNG uh, was first mooted, where the, you know it's made clear that the government is, look, is looking uh, to put the environment at the heart of planning and the environment, plus a few other bits and pieces out there. I, I noticed the other day that there's a British standard, 8683, uh, for the process of designing and implementing BNG projects and schemes. So there you go. That's something I learned uh, while putting this together. So just moving on. So the key components of mandatory BNG. I'm not going to go through all of this. I think we know most of the the, the key principles, but I think it is significant to uh, highlight that you know the Environment Act amends the Town and Country Planning Act 1990. Uh, for planning generally and the Planning Act 2008 for nationally significant infrastructure projects. So, you know, it makes BNG carry the weight of law. And I know that's obvious, but I think it's worth reminding ourselves that, you know, this is carrying the weight of law now. Um, alongside this, we have uh, environment, including biodiversity targets uh, that should be set, met, measured and reported. Uh, and that's all going to be something that planning is going to be involved in, have a role in some one way or another. And also um, public bodies are going to be asked to make environmental improvement plans and the Office for Environmental Protection uh, will effectively oversee how public bodies, bodies carry out their duties. So we're all we're all part of this 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 scene, if you like. And it is, you know, it's by condition uh, that biodiversity gain will be made part of the planning permission. And I'm sure um, if there are DM colleagues on the call or you're working with DM colleagues, I'm sure they'll have a view on how that is going to become an integral part of our plan making and decision making. And I'll be interested maybe from some of the other presenters or people in the room, you know, how you're working with plans teams, DM teams together looking at this. So the local plan uh, and BNG uh, made the point earlier, you know, 10% is now going to be a legisl legislative uh, requirement and it can't be reduced, you know, with a viability argument. Good. Um, so as, as, a, as a legal requirement, there's no need for repeating the law in your local plans. But as with any sort of newish requirement, I think it's wise to think about uh, what and how much we actually do say or repeat in our local plans. Um, 
I guess it's a bit like national development management policy as if and when they do uh, come in there's you know there's no need to repeat wording per se but look at what plans but we'll, we'll look at what plans might actually say uh, in a moment and there's been some good examples sent around previously by by Sam prior to this this meeting um, but since the Environment Act was first passed uh, planning advisory service we've been encouraging uh, councils to develop locally specific BNG policy you know prior to to November to test approaches that you might want to take um, there's a possibility, I don't know if you're experiencing this, that developers wanting to get uh, developments in before having to adhere to the, the mandatory uh, BNG. And also just to help you think about corporately setting strategy. Uh, you can't do that sort of thing early enough, we don't think. So, you know, on that last point, you know, BNG needs to be part uh, of a wider corporate strategy on biodiversity. It's much wider than just the local plan. And we think, you know, tying all that the environmental and wider corporate programs together is the best way uh, with effective governance to, to, de to deliver on biodiversity. So what might be included in the local plan? Um, local plans are by definition local and you know while I said earlier uh, avoid repeating anything national uh, there will be a need to explain you know what it is, uh, what is its purpose, what does it require of developers, of stakeholders and the local plan is an appropriate place to, to put these sorts of things. So you know, it's also helpful in the local plan to set your context. Um, uh, biodiversity doesn't sit in isolation, as I said, it does sit with other initiatives and you might want to position it uh, with other uh, elements of uh, strategy, such as local um, uh, nature recovery, uh, local uh, nature recovery strategies. Uh, there are also the things that developers and the public need to understand about how it operates, you know, the mitigation hierarchy, you know, on and off site um, mitigation and how that's going to work. Um, so I just lost my, my notes here. OK, um, you're going to have potentially different ways of treating different development sites. I think that should come into the local plan in some way and your overall strategy, uh, you know, where you're going to encourage applications, perhaps for things like habitat, habitat banks, uh, and then your mitigation op op options, the hierarchy, you know, the avoidance, minimization, restoration offsets. How are you as a council locally wanting to implement all of these uh, facets of the biodiversity uh, mandatory BNG? Um, yeah, some sort of considerations for the local plan as well. I mean, most of these arguably they're, they're what you already do as plan makers with your local plan. You know, you agree and you set out your local priorities. Um, you, you set out your uh, site allocation and site selection methodology. Um, that's that's all going to be the same, but you need this layer of biodiversity net gain. How is that going to impact on those decisions? Um, evidence base, we all put together evidence base for local plans. Those councils, quite a few of them now going above the 10% mandatory target. Uh, if you're going to do that, that needs to be justified. Planning inspector needs to be satisfied that it's justified and that it's a viable viable option all the usual plan making considerations need to come in and you know other things around setting your targets accessing the metric it, all those sorts of things need to be part of your local plan considerations that support we are we've got quite a wide program uh, of support i think one of the main um things is our peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, and that's why it's great to come to things like this uh, you know the best parts of these sessions are the questions and the interaction rather than listening to someone like me wittering on but yeah we have a a, a thing called base camp where we you can join that and I'll show you, uh, give you an email address to email if you want to join that. It's our practitioner network. It allows you to discuss uh, topics and share documents with um, with your peers. Um, we have lots of online resources, lots of FAQs on our, our website. We have a BNG process flow chart, all part of them. Um, and with sorry, that's in conjunction with the Future Homes Hub. Um, and we often put on workshops and events do sign up to our newsletter because that will give you best access to all of our events that we put on. They're normally free of charge. Uh, just some final thoughts. Um, there's a few things here, but I think my main message is not to treat BNG as separate, a separate thing to your other plan making activity, uh, and especially not to the overall environmental strategy of the council because, um, oh, and, and of course, wider regional approaches, which is why a session like today is good where you can hear what others uh, are doing and how, you know, something like the environment doesn't just stop at your borders, how you can uh, work with other councils uh, to make uh, good BNG things happen. So I've kind of whistled through that. 
probably a bit quicker than I thought I was going to, but um, there's some information about uh, how to get information about our work. Uh, and now I'm happy to take questions or observations or, or thoughts. I hope that was OK, Sam. Yeah, that was brilliant. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, just raise your hand and we'll work through the list. Um, first come, first serve. Can't have been that comprehensive. <laughs> Has anyone joined the uh, base camp out of interest? Because I think we spoke to someone in the Norfolk Working Group who said it was brilliant and really useful. So I just wonder how many on the call had joined that. Yeah, I'm on there. Thank you. Is anyone else or is it just? Oh, there's quite a few thumbs up. OK. Yeah, yeah. Yep, Anna. Oh, great. Oh, thank you so much for your presentation. It's really helpful. Um. Would you advocate local authorities producing SPD or do you think that we're just going to be duplicating guidance, uh, the, the national guidance? Would that only be necessary really if we were looking to go to beyond the statutory minimum when biodiversity net gain becomes mandatory? If I was if I was to go down one route, yeah, I think I would do an SPD if I was doing something out of the, the norm. Um, oh yeah, it's nothing to stop you doing it anyway, but I think if you're going to put effort into uh, into doing something outside of you know, sort of the minimum, I think if you're going to do something different, I would um, I would go for or if you're if you're going above the 10 percent, that's where I would draw the line on creating an SPD. Thank you, that's really helpful. Uh, Rebecca, you've got your hand up. Yeah, hi, uh, Anna. Um, I, I think well, the other thing I was going to say, can you hear me OK? Yes, yeah, perfectly, yeah thank yeah. you. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that I wouldn't expect the national guidance to say a huge amount. So obviously on the planning side, we'll have the MPPF and hopefully the PPG will be updated. And I mean, what's in the PPG at the moment on biodiversity net gain is really good, actually, but it's not going to get into those local circumstances. And that's what, you know, as, as Martin said, it's that's what you can get into in your SPD or the local plan policy. I think the key thing is, as you guys will know, it's just to have that hook in your local plan to the SPD to not bring it in without any kind of hook. But um, uh, I think I, I, you know, things like how you set a strategy for where you want off-site biodiversity net gain to cut that is not going to be in the national guidance and it, there's not going to be very much detail on that at all uh, i mean i don't know i expect you will have seen the guidance that we've had so far from defra and it's it's very sparse so i would expect any additional guidance you know basically there's not going to be any guidance from defra on local plans at all the only stuff that will come in local plans will be in the mppf and ppg um, and also potentially in relation to local nature recovery strategies as well. There's going to be some specific guidance on those. So that's the link in. But yeah, I would. Yeah, I, as Martin said, I definitely encourage you to 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 think about that because it's not I, I, I you know, if you're if you want to just rely on the sort of legal aspect, that's very much around DM decision making, really, rather than local plans. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. We've, we're sort of in a position where we've just adopted or recently adopted a local plan, so we're not quite at the point where we're thinking of, do, of reviewing our existing policy. But so maybe there is definitely a role for, an, for some kind of SPD setting out a bit more detail locally. Thank you. Are, are you thinking, Anna, of going above 10 percent? Um, I, I personally have been thinking about it. I'm not sure um, about the appetite within my what the wide organisation yet, though. OK, thanks. Thank you. OK, is there any other questions? If not, I, I was wondering, it's not so much of a question, but I've been thinking about how identifying priority sites for BNG within the local plan. Is that something you think is a good idea? And is it good to identify the strategies that you think should be used to direct BNG, like the ones that your authority recognises? Because I know there's a wide range of I think I might have frozen. Can anyone hear me? Yeah. You can? I can still hear you. Oh, OK, sorry. Sorry, everything sort of went a bit um, stuttery on my screen. Um, yeah, like, would you recommend identifying the strategies that you think the um, 
the st strategic uh, like multiplier applies on the metric. So it'd be worse for identifying the various strategies that you think as a council you want to recognise. So um, biodiversity action plans, LNRS, um, anything like that. Would would you say that's something worth doing, Martin? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think in in the work that I do is you know I was saying earlier, not treating BNG just a on its own in isolation, but treating it within your sort of whole plan making priorities and your strategies. So you're going to have your strategies for land, so your strategies for housing, employment, all those sort of things your plan has to deliver. It's factoring in alongside that, what are our priorities for the environment? How do we make the two work together? Understanding that, getting agreement with that corporately, and then looking at your site allocations strategy uh, and maybe factoring or weighting certain aspects of it, depending on what it is you're trying to achieve and encouraging different, maybe different types of sites to come forward that maybe have a more beneficial um, angle for uh, BNG uh, than you might have previously. But there's no one size fits all. It, I think it, it's about understanding what it is you're trying to achieve, you know, on the basis, you know, basic 10 percent, but also, you know, that wider environmental um bng net gain you know how how can you use your land the local plan to deliver what it is you're trying to achieve so i mean the short answer is yes you should um but not in isolation for what the rest of the plan is trying to achieve okay thank you thank you very much uh catherine oh hey, yeah thank you well, it was just a random idea that i've had i've no idea how we're gonna um sort of use it as a <laughs> a little bit of leverage but um it'd be really useful within our within, within norfolk if we say can you use locally sourced green hay rather than a generic seed mix give it an extra weighting uh, the extra bit of, sort of credit than just using a something commercial but um there we go <laughs> thank you catherine is there is that a possibility at all? Do you think, Martin? I think um, I suppose you could just encourage it through the local plan policy. I'm not too sure if you could give it any kind of like um, uplift through the metric. That would be the only thing that comes to my mind. Yeah, I'm, no. I'm, going, I'm going to encourage it, but mm. yeah, it'd be useful to have a little bit of extra sort of leverage somewhere in the system because we've got our, we've got our local. We'll have our green corridors. And it's like awesome, but. Yeah, I wonder whether something like that might be a bit too detailed maybe for a local plan, but part of the decision making process, giving weight to um, a decision, um, it might be you know a local requirement of, of a certain kind to to play in the favour of, of of getting a favourable decision on a planning application if certain uh, certain approaches are taken, materials used, etc. So maybe I think you know there's something in the decision making. I don't know if it goes far it as does, um, it doesn't have much weight though. That's a, it's kind of no. Well, a lot yeah. of things don't, do they? But no. they'll have more weight if you've got maybe if you've got it written down. Maybe it's part of your I don't know. Valid might be part of the validation requirements. It might be wrong there, but if I'm getting the getting the right end of the the stick, I mean with a lot of these things, you know, especially with environmental things, I think I'd encourage councils to you know push as far as you can, not you know, not without evidence, but push as far as you can and be uh, don't be too specific. Leave yourself some room because I think, you know, this this uh, agenda is is only going to grow and the more flexibility and the more you build into your local plan and your development management policies, uh, the better and the easier, you know, you can flex as things move as you go along. I'm no I'm no expert though in the, the, the sort of thing you just mentioned, so I'm, uh, I'm slightly free forming here. Catherine, it's, it's certainly something we favour when we talk to large large developers like the National Grid about their biodiversity net gain delivery. Um, we've asked them to use like locally sourced seeds or natural regeneration for the most part. There's been one development that's uh, next to a, an ancient woodland and we suggested that they could yeah, basically allow it to naturally regenerate next to it. Um, and so we'll go for like a more of a rewilding approach, use, use like the genetics already in the area, um, that sort of thing. So it's certainly something we're pushing as much as possible. Um, it does sound like a really good idea. I think uh, Anita's got a hand up. 
Yes, just really to pick up on uh, the point of using locally sourced hay, um, that wouldn't go down very well in Ipswich because we're a largely urban area. Um, it would have to be something that would appear in an SPD as a suggestion. Um, local plan policies can't be prescriptive and say, you, you know, you shall use this and not this. Um, so it'd have to be a, it would have to appear in an SPD. I didn't have any um, further points to make, but that was just in response to um, that point. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Is there any other questions or comments? Um, otherwise, I think we'll draw it to a close and move on to the next presentation. No, nothing else. OK, well, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Rebecca, for joining. I really appreciate your time. I'm sure everyone else did. And um, do get in touch with them if there's anything you want, I suppose, around it, around their offer. Um, that's brilliant. Thanks. So uh, next on the list, we've got uh, Fiona Fries, the principal planner uh, for policy and section 106 at Salford City Council. And Fiona is going to cover what Salford did in terms of justifying their policy in advance of the Environment Act. Uh, discuss the positives of their policy, including the parts not covered by the Environment Act, and as well as uh, uh, any other potential improvements that could be made to their policy. Uh, Fiona is going to touch a little bit on the advantage that joint working has had on their uh, on their plan, uh, their plan on their work on BNG, um, and is also going to draw on her experiences of working closely with uh, development management colleagues as well. Um, so if you want to share your slides, Fiona, that'd be awesome. Thanks. That working? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, Thanks. good afternoon, everyone. As Sam said, I work in the policy team, but I also do Section 106 alongside development management colleagues. So I've been quite close to both the development and the implementation of our biodiversity net gain policy. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'll just touch briefly on the Greater Manchester context before I look at our local plan policy and then reflect on the implementation. We were very fortunate in Greater Manchester to have some external resource to help with early development of biodiversity net gain policy. Um, a task group was set up which involved a range of public sector partners and some significant consultancy support as well. As part of that, they had detailed meetings with all 10 councils, which were attended by development management and policy. Draft guidance was produced back in 2019, although for some reason it wasn't actually published until 2021. That's the image on the slide. Uh, we've benefited also from quite a lot of training sessions for both officers and politicians. And um, the joint working is, is very much an ongoing thing. So we meet about every two months now as officers to talk about biodiversity net gain. And the focus is sort of moving on to nature recovery and the local nature recovery strategy as well. Um, this is just an image of one of the diagrams from the net gain guidance. We found images like this were quite helpful in terms of explaining the concept to, to partners and, and politicians and so on, um, just especially as it was a, a new idea when Greater Manchester started talking about it. Moving on then to our local plan, um, which is subside or called a fairer city, and fairness is very much a, a key theme that runs through the plan. It aims to create a better and fairer Salford for all. And every chapter in the plan starts with a little box about how it's going to create a fair Salford. The biodiversity uh, chapter is no exception to that. Um, seeking obviously to ensure that development is genuinely sustainable, setting out strategic objectives as you might expect for the city over the long term, although that doesn't include housing targets in this plan because they're being taken forward through a joint plan. So looking at the drivers, which are kind of the things that we use to help justify going for net gain in advance of the Environment Act, approximately half of the city area is open land, which includes parks, farmland and also areas that were previously developed where buildings have been demolished and it's been grassed over. About 30 percent green belt. We have very high levels of deprivation in some parts of the city, but also some quite wealthy areas. So within the city, there's high levels of inequality very high levels of development. So, for example, 2,800 dwellings in 21-22, but of relevance for biodiversity, 92% of those are on brownfield land and 80% were apartments. Uh, looking at our biodiversity drivers, only 27% of our local sites in positive conservation management, none of our surface water bodies at good ecological status and no nationally or internationally designated sites for nature conservation. 
What we do have is this area of green belt in the west of the city, which is part of a narrow gap between the Manchester and Merseyside conurbations, which is thought to be quite important for species movement, uh, species moving north in a warming climate. Uh, that area is mostly peat and former lowland raised bog. So just a map showing our biodiversity assets, you can kind of see these are mostly concentrated in the west of the city, um, plus there's a river valley that runs in towards the centre. For context, the centre of Manchester city centre is just to the southeast of our boundary above where the legend sits on this map. Um, so looking at our policy then, all development shall deliver a net gain in biodiversity value, but all major development shall deliver at least a 10% net gain in biodiversity value. Um, so that's the key part of the policy, really. And it's worth saying that we couldn't have gone in advance of the Environment Act if our politicians hadn't been very supportive. Both our current and our previous lead member were very supportive of the environmental agenda, including biodiversity net gain. Um, so apologies to the slightly wordy nature of this slide. Just this part of the policy I thought was worth looking at in more detail. This is the priorities for offsite compensation. Um, and this is in this regard, really, our local plan policy does go quite a lot more further, quite a lot further than the Environment Act or the metric. Um, that's partly driven by the issues of fairness that I've already mentioned. Um, and it's partly also a desire to steer investment into our biodiversity heartlands. So just coming back to this map, um, the, the bright green line shows chat moss, which is green belt and peatland. The, uh, the hatched area within that, the, the turquoise hatched area, is the biodiversity heartlands where the focus is bog restoration and other biodiversity improvements. Um, but a lot of the development takes place sort of further into the, the centre of the city, um, particularly the high density development. So just trying to, to deliver those local priorities, really. Um, it's yet to be tested, really. Well, obviously, the Environment Act's not in yet. It's yet to be tested how well this would work in the face of if somebody's meeting the requirements of the metric and the Environment Act. Uh, can we refuse permission on the basis of our local plan policy? Uh, the other thing that it's worth saying is, in practice, to operate a detailed policy like this, you need a really good supply of available offset sites. And we're not yet at the place where we've got that that. Um, good supply. So we're very happy to have this in the plan, especially given what, what has come out with the Metric and the Environment Act in terms of LPAs not having a great deal of say. So I, I do think it is worth looking at wording like this. But as I say, it's we've yet to really be able to use this detail in practice. When we were developing the policy, we did get some challenges uh, particularly at publication stage. So developers were challenging the 10% requirement on viability grounds. This was at a point when the environment bill was still at quite early stages. We also got a number of challenges from an environmental perspective. There were people worried about it being a license to trash, if you like. So um, concerns that, for example, farmland birds weren't going to be adequately protected, concerns that trees wouldn't be adequately protected and concerns that climate change wasn't going to be adequately taken into account by this approach. Um, in response to that, we produced a detailed note on biodiversity net gain uh, before we submitted our plan for examination. And we did get far less challenge at subsequent stages. I'd like to think that was because of our note, but I suspect that actually it was because the Environment Bill or Act was progressing and therefore um, there was generally a bit more understanding about biodiversity net gain and it was becoming more widely accepted as an idea. So moving on to implementation then, we actually put the metric on our validation checklist about two years before we adopted our local plan back in early 2021. Um, at that point we were implementing it based on the MPPF. Um, we didn't actually, we would negotiate uh, for net gain, but our bottom line in reality was no net loss at that point, as Martin said that the MPPF doesn't have a lot of teeth in terms of seeking net gain. Um, but that did give us useful experience before we got to the point of adopting our local plan in terms of handling the metric and discussing it with developers. Uh, so now that we've got our local plan, we're seeking 10% on major applications and 
some evidence of net gain on minor applications. We've had discussions internally about what that evidence of net gain looks like and we're trying to be proportionate. It depends on the size of the minor application, how much evidence we're asking for. And uh, we are working towards a list of potential offset sites. We're at the stage of commissioning habitat management plans for several of those sites. So looking at issues and challenges then, raising awareness of the new requirements was a challenge, particularly at the point that we first put the metric on our validation checklist. Some of the metrics that we received at the time were, were quite interesting. There was one where the, uh, the habitat survey showed a large area of grassland that just wasn't present on the metric. And, and when we queried it, the consultants came back with something along the lines of, oh, we thought it was all AstroTurf. Um, I'm pleased to say that I think it's got better in terms of what we're getting. And, and the vast majority of applications that we get now are accompanied by quite good net gain information. Uh, this issue about people clearing sites uh, before they sent the ecologist in to survey, we had a few of those. Um, that actually resulted in us making a modification to our local plan during examination stage, uh, wording along the lines of what's in the Environment Act about uh, the uh, January 2020, if you cleared the site after that. Then uh, we look at the baseline uh, that you know we, we use what we can to, to come up with the baseline. Identifying offset sites, I've already mentioned that's a bit of a challenge at the moment. One of the biggest issues for us actually is finding space to plant trees. Where an offset is required, it's typically because they're cutting down mature trees. That seems to be the thing that tends to, most often tends to swing it in terms of not being able to accommodate the uh, biodiversity net gain on site. And as an urban area, with the green belt mostly being peat, finding suitable locations to plant trees is challenging. A lot, and partly also historically, there has been quite a lot of tree planting in Salford. We, we've had initiatives for decades about tree planting and we are running out of sites to plant the trees on. Um, then local benefits versus strategic priorities. This is quite a big issue for us. The, uh, the photo on the right of this slide is one of the bog restoration sites, but for residents in inner city Salford without access to a car, that, that site is virtually impossible to get to. So th those issues of fairness and, and how we balance the impacts of development on our local communities and what might be best ecologically. Um, also in terms of you know, we're not really losing bog habitat to development when we uh, develop in most of Salford, but that is where we'd like to see quite a lot of our offset. That That's also an issue in terms of how that plays out with the metric. And um, we're coming across a number of legal and practical issues around securing offsets on council owned land. That's very much an active conversation at the moment as we look towards November. Um, I've just put a last bullet point here about local nature recovery strategies and, and their role in guiding investment because they're being developed at a county level, uh, just needing to make sure that local priorities are still addressed because what's important locally might, might start to look less important once you're looking at a county level. I think that's my last slide. Yeah, so I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you, Fiona. That was really, really interesting. I think... Um, particularly a lot to think about for other urban LPAs in our area, like Ipswich and Norwich, I imagine there's a lot to take home there. Um, and also around LLRS as well. Just it's a really important point around getting LPAs to engage on LLRS because it's county led, as you say, or led by a responsible authority. So that's really interesting. Um, 